Cold War, for the first time in the history of humanity, a new brute force form from methodical killing would enter the stage of the 20th century society, demanding the most efficient, most effective way to kill endless waves of troops in cold blood. To rise to this cause, society would have to undergo a transformation in political power, economic stability and social standards to compensate for the all-consuming war machine. It's a warfare that not only targets military personnel, but the civilians on the home front. Today, in the final episode of Flashback for this series, we take a snapshot of civilian life in Britain during the war to change the world. When war was declared, there was a mixed mood within Britain. For many months, the decision of whether to engage in warfare was in the balance with the politicians. But the final ultimatum upon Belgian neutrality instigated a societal resurgence to support the country, often with great rallies in places such as Trafalgar Square, calling upon the leaders of the nation to honour the 1839 Treaty of London, which stated Britain would be nationally inclined to preserve Belgian neutrality in times of crisis. When war was declared on Germany and the rest of the alliance, sign-ups for war soared. In fact, the army could not supply enough khaki uniform to satisfy demand, so some recruits had to make do with improvised uniform or wooden rifles. It was popularly expected, although not universally, that the war would last up until Christmas. But this conservative estimate was soon dropped as the war dragged into December, with not even the faintest inclination of death. Into 1915, sign-ups slumped. Despite the effort of women in installations such as the Active Service League, and the distribution of white devils by former suffragettes. The government was to initiate a large propaganda drive to boost recruitment. Yet the only option seemingly fair and viable to the government by autumn 1915 was conscription, making military service for men of a certain marital status and age compulsory. This was then rolled out in January 1916 and later extended to a wider demographic of men in later months and years. With more men entering the war and less men in the munitions factories, the shortage of armaments was inevitable, so in 1915, the Times again exposed the munitions crisis, sparking the newly formed Ministry of Munitions to, to take drastic actions, to add government backing towards the dilution of the industry, the introduction of women into the workplaces, on the buses, in the offices, and in several industrious roles, namely, however, in munitions fabrication. The work wasn't easy because the conditions weren't great, but did improve during the war. But largely, the major deterrence was the danger of operating in the factories. Working with TNT would intoxicate the women, with the side effect being a yellowish tinge to their skin, earning them the name of the canaries. Prolonged exposure tended to affect the nervous system, cause neurological problems, and even result in death in extreme cases. Not only were civilians threatened by war work, but this new breed of warfare made them viable targets for attack. In the early years, Submarines led ordnance strikes along the coastal cities of Scarborough, Hartlepool and Whitby. 1,500 shells rained from the sky, sealing the fates of 127 innocent civilians. This was just the beginning, however. As aerial transport began to enter the field, Zeppelins and Gothic GIVs launched and attacked the coast and central cities, mainly London. A raid of Gothers led to an attack on German residents within Britain and finally persuaded the King George V to change his name from Saxe Coburg Gotha to Windsor. Even since 1914, U-boats started to target import ships, transporting over 60% of food Britain consumed. As the campaign became more and more effective, to its pinnacle in 1917, when Britain had just six weeks a week left, serious food shortages plagued the nation. The nation reacted by turning all available land into allotments for grain crops and the Women's Land Army, established formally at the start of 1917, came into operation. Paired alongside rapid inflation, the working class struggled to survive, whilst the rich began to cut down their own consumption, though they often hoarded food. Into 1918, there was only one logical way of dealing with the food crisis, rationing. The government went lengths to ensure no one tried to circumvent the Russian books, and thankfully, by November 1918, no one starved. The rationing scheme continued long after the war to allow the country to recuperate. But how did the government get so much power in the first place? In 1914, the Defence of the Realm Act was introduced and gave the government sweeping powers to control society. Now, the government told you what the time was, when you could eat, where you could go, and what would happen if you didn't abide by their dictated ruling. It went so far as to stop the sale of chocolate in cinemas after eight, 
introducing British summertime and stopping bells from chiming during the night. The people were influenced by all these new things due to the employment of propaganda, biased posters and films telling them what to do. The most famous we all know would probably be the one with Lord Kitchener, but the government made thousands of pieces of propaganda during the war, which ranged from the eating of bread to the joining of soldiers into the Western Front. Of course, if the nation knew the true extent of the destruction of the war, especially from the Somme, the country would have become demoralised, so to prevent news from reaching the general public, censorship was introduced, and it manipulated news from the Western Front. Even letters sent home from the troops were doctors and altered at pro-warfare bias. There were, of course, men who opposed the war, and these became known as conscientious objectors, or more commonly, conscious. These men refused to fight on moral, political or religious grounds. I have a total involvement in the war, who became known as absolutists, or those who didn't want to fight, alternativists. These countries were treated harshly in the general public, some even died for their moral convictions. The war would radicalise government powers and change societal reality drastically, if not for only during the war years. Through the power of Dora, the introduction of women into the workplace and the attacks upon civilians from the air and sea, life in Britain entered, for a time, an unprecedented state of power, belief and control. And that's the British Death Study completed. Join Flashback next time when we start our new series on post-war world. See you then.